Cooler Master's MK730 gaming mechanical keyboard is the more portable version of their flagship Master Key 750 and features the same premium brushed aluminum finished and floating key design as well as genuine Cherry MX switches in blue, brown, or red. Use the function keys for on-the-fly RGB LED control, admire the stylish bottom and side light bars, and feel the comfort of the removable wrist rest in a 10 keyless form factor that you can easily take on the go. It's got USB Type-C too, so click the sponsor link in the description for more. What's up guys, welcome back to Paul's Hardware. This is my monthly builds video for September 2019. Every month I go over a couple parts lists for systems. If you're looking to build a system, you need to start out with what parts to build with. So that's what this series is all about. If you want to actually see me build a system, uh, check out my builds playlist, which I'll link down in the description. I've been building systems for many, many years now and I do lots of videos on putting them together and stuff. So you can check that out for recent builds or if you need a more direct tutorial, check out my beginner's guide to building a PC uh, because you can apply all all of those tips and tricks to building the systems I am talking about today. Speaking of the systems I'm talking about today, these are based on your votes from last month. So when I asked what gaming PC builds you wanted to see in September, number one response was the cheapest build possible with an RTX 2080 Ti within reason. That within reason part is important. We also have a back to college build or an entry level $400 to $500 build based on the 3000 series AMD APU. Now a back to college build, uh, you know, it's pretty flexible there. So I'm gonna say either of these builds could be back to college builds whether you have uh, close to $2,000 to spend or whether you have about $500 to spend, uh, build either of these systems and then take them to college with you and then it's a back to college build how that works. Uh, also, we have a straw poll, of course, for next month. So if you want to vote on what gaming PC builds you want to see in October, I have some various themes we can go with or, you know, just a regular gaming PC. All that said, I'm using PC Part Picker to put my parts lists together today, and I'll link these in the description as well as links to individual parts, starting off with that cheapest possible PC with an RTX 2080 Ti within reason, and the total I came up with here is about $1,900. You can actually get it down to, I guess, a little less than $1,850 if you go for some promo discounts and some mail-in rebates, but those aren't always available, so I'm sticking with about a $1,900 price, which is, I guess, kind of nice depending on how you look at it, because that means that over half of this build's price is just the graphics card in and of itself, because 2080 Ti's are expensive. They're supposed to start at $1,000, but you'll find them difficult to find actually at $1,000. You need to spend a little bit more than that, so shame on you, Nvidia, for telling us you could buy this for a thousand bucks when you have to actually pay more. But if you search for 2080 Ti's and you sort by price, you can find a few in the low $1,000 range. The EVGA black card is the cheapest one for about $1,020 right now, although again, that is taking into account some promo codes that are bouncing around. So keep an eye out for the cheapest one you can find, and if you can actually find one for a thousand bucks, then good on you because they're still difficult to find at that price. We'd have some Zotac and MSI options also down in the sub $1,100 price range, so keep an eye on, out on those as well. My next choice was what CPU should I pair with this beastly graphics card in order to get the most out of it when it comes to gaming. And since we didn't mention streaming or other multi-purpose CPU usage with this build, I stuck with strictly the gaming performance, which means I'm going with Intel and one of the newest Intel 9000 series processors. Specifically, I decided to go with the i7 90 700K, which is unlocked for overclocking and is an eight core processor, although it is not multi-threaded. So it's eight cores and eight threads versus some of the AMD options that give you eight cores and 16 threads for roughly the same price. The competitor here would be the 3700X or the 3800X for this price range. And if you are gonna be gaming and streaming or doing a lot of video encoding or something like that, you might wanna opt for that. But if you want the most frames out of your 2080 Ti, the 9700K, 9900K, and also the 9600K can get you uh, most of the performance out of it. So consider the 9600K as well, that you can get that for about 220 to $230, but that is just a six core, six thread processor. So when I considered the within reason portion of my description for this build, I decided to bump it up to the 9700K. And you can currently get that for 340 bucks at Best Buy? Oh, okay, Best Buy, sure. Why not? Uh, next up, we need a cooler for this processor, and I was trying to stick to that budget here, so a Cooler Master Hyper 212 Black, I think, is the nice cross between. It looks good, because it's all black, cheap, it's only about 40 bucks, and it's just a very good cooler, so it's gonna get you some nice overclocks even with your 9700K, and if you want even a little bit more performance out of it, you can consider adding another fan to it, because you can go push-pull with this. 
For our motherboard, we have a Gigabyte Z390 Aorus Pro Wi-Fi. And here again, I wanted to make sure you could uh, do overclocking and everything. And this is a very well-reviewed motherboard. It's got uh, plenty of RGB lighting, of course, not that, that affects your performance at all, but it's got a couple M.2 slots and it's got really good power delivery for that overclocking as well. It's also got some cool features like a fixed IO shield. So uh, Gigabyte actually did a really good job with their Z390 motherboards. And this one is one that is uh, regularly recommended. Also has Wi-Fi built in 802.11ac. So I think that's going to be a good choice. It's also a pretty nice looking board. So, you know, can't, no complaints there. For memory, I just want a 16 gig kit and we want a DDR4, of course, and we want probably a little bit faster. You can get away with uh, less fast memory with Intel, but I still wanted to go for 3000 or 3200 speed. And you can get this uh, real nice Corsair Vengeance LPX kit. It's DDR4 3200 for about $70 right now. These are pretty simple looking, but uh, it's cast latency 16. It's a solid kit and who needs RGB LEDs when you're only paying $70. And for storage, I'm just using the the parametric filter function on PC Part Picker to get us a uh, SSD that's about 500 gig class that will be anywhere from 480 to 512 gigs. I want an SSD, of course, and then I just sorted by price per gigabyte, and you can find those for less than $50 if you at least take the ADA to SU635 into account. And a SATA SSD will get you all the gaming performance you need. Going with a faster SSD will not get you better gaming performance. It might make your levels load a little bit faster, but it's really not going to be a significant difference. That said, it might be worth it for you to look down at some of the M.2 drives that are available. You can get an NVMe drive that will get you significant faster read and write performance speeds. Something like an Intel 660p or an ADATA XPG SX6000 will get you much better overall performance out of that SSD. Again, won't affect your frame rate in games, but if you're only going to pay an extra 10 or 15 bucks, it's worth checking that out. That said, since we're, we're supposed to be sticking to a budget with this and it's not going to affect the gaming performance, I just stuck with that ADATA drive. Finally, we need a case and uh, for 70 bucks, the Masterbox NR600 has proven to be a very good one because I wanted lots of airflow and this one has a really nice front mesh cover. There's actually a couple different variations of this case, but it's got really nice uh, cable management area in the back. Uh, it's got a nice open window here to look inside at your finished build. It's got a power supply basement in the bottom to hide the ugly power supply that I chose. It's not an uh, ugly power supply, but it's not the prettiest looking one. And it comes with a couple fans pre-installed, so you know, you can add more if you want, but you do have airflow right out of the box. So for 70 bucks, I felt like that was a nice compromise between uh, slightly more on the budget side, but still is going to give you all the performance that you need. Finally, of course, we need a power supply. And for that, I went with the EVGA 700 GD. Power supply prices have gone up in the US, unfortunately. And from my understanding, that is due to the tariffs. But I wanted 80 plus gold because we're pairing it with a 2080 Ti. And for a 2080 Ti, you probably want 650 watts at minimum. This one's 700 watts, so it gives you a little bit more breathing room. And it is not modular, but it does have all black cables. You can spend another five to 10 bucks to get a partially modular uh, 80 plus gold rated power supply that would be comparable to this one. Uh, that said, the only hesitation I had here is this is a brand new series of power supplies from EVGA. No reviews or anything like that on it. So uh, I'm going by EVGA's track record that they've been making solid power supplies for quite some time now. And I hope EVGA keeps that up with this GD series because it does seem to be like a nice combination between uh, a budget price with some decent features, although you do lack the modularity. So there it is, my cheapest possible PC within reason with an RTX 2080 Ti coming in at $1,900. So you're spending about 900 bucks on everything else and about a little over a thousand dollars on the graphics card with this build. But the 2080 Ti is the fastest card you can get right now. So a lot of people are looking at what you can put together. Finally, if anyone's going to look at this and be like, oh, you don't have enough storage or something like that. That's very normal for me. I always assume that you might have an old hard drive lying around or just the ability to add storage is very simple with the gaming PC. So that's why I went with the bare minimum, which in my opinion right now is about a 500 gig SSD, maybe an M.2 NVMe one if you got a few more bucks to spend. Here's my second build for this month. This is an entry level $500 gaming PC and I wanted to use one of the AMD APUs. Uh, AM, I'm, not, I'm not even sure if AMD is using the term APU anymore. They don't seem to be throwing that around as much, but what it means for AMD is that it's got a CPU with graphics built in, so you don't need to pay for a graphics card. The graphics that are built into these AMD 3000 series APUs are Vega based and they're actually pretty nice. Don't get them confused with say, $150 or $200 plus discrete 
discrete graphics card because that will give you a bump up in performance, but this can get you by out of the door. If you're gaming at 1080p, they're perfectly adequate. You might need to lower some settings and games here and there, but it will get you a gaming PC that's up and running. And then you can easily add a discrete graphics card to the system in the future if you so desire. So here's the parts list. It's pretty simple with only six components involved. Uh, base price is $513. There's some mail-in rebates that get you down to 484. So I've rounded it to $500 and it uh, features a Ryzen 5 3400G quad-core processor with integrated graphics. And then uh, let me talk about the rest of my decisions for this build in just a quick moment. First off, the 3400G. It's right here available for as little as $140. With the 2000 series APUs, I tended to veer towards the 2200G, which is about $100. I do feel like with the 3000 series APUs, AMD has made the higher end one a little bit more uh, compelling with the price of $140. Uh, back in the 2000 series, they were the higher end one was like 160 to 170 bucks, which didn't make quite as much sense. That said, you can get a 3200G and save yourself about 40 bucks, although the 3200G will run at a lower frequency and it does not have uh, simultaneous multi-threading. So you get four cores and four threads versus four cores and eight threads that you get with the 3400G. It does have RX Vega 11 graphics built in, which means you can take advantage of the video outs on the motherboard. And then the last thing to point out is that even though this is a 3000 series processor from AMD, it is not based on seven nanometer Zen 2 micro architecture. It's based on the 12 nanometer Zen plus micro architecture. So just keep that in mind. If you are looking at the upgrade path for the system and the system is completely designed with an upgrade path in mind, you can get more single threaded CPU performance and just overall CPU performance if you were to upgrade from this processor to one of the regular 3000 series processors like a 3600, 3600X or any of the ones above that. Oh, and you also get a little bit better cooler with this one. You get the Wraith Spire rather than the Wraith Stealth that comes with the 3200G. Moving on though, we need a motherboard and I've once again chosen the MSI B450 Tomahawk. And hear me out here because I've recommended this motherboard in a bunch of different builds over the past six months to a year. The reason I went with this is because we're trying to stick to a budget. And if you wanna go with a 500 series motherboard, you gotta go with an X570 motherboard. And those start at about 150 to $160. And the cheaper X570 motherboards leave a lot to be desired. I was briefly considering this Asus Prime X570-P because it does have pretty good cooling performance on the VRMs, but it's lacking in other areas, especially for pairing with an APU because it only has a single HDMI out. So you wouldn't be able to set up multiple monitors, for example. So for that reason, I just stuck with the B450 Tomahawk. You will potentially need to update the UEFI BIOS on this motherboard in order for your APU to even work because this motherboard is older, the CPU is newer. So the motherboard needs to be updated to, in order to recognize the CPU. That said, this motherboard has a feature called BIOS Flashback Plus, which allows you to update without a CPU or memory installed, which should allow you to get around that nasty need to have an older CPU in order to update the motherboard to recognize your newer CPU. It also has a couple video outs, which is nice, so you could at least set up dual monitors, although one of them is a, is a DVI, but that's still just as functional as an HDMI port for the most part. And I guess the last thing to point out here is that MSI does have a newer version of this motherboard called the MSI B450 Tomahawk Max, which is pre-updated for support for the 3000 series CPUs from AMD, but I can't, I still can't find those for sale anywhere at all. So I'm gonna stick with this one because it's about 110 to 115 dollars. It's actually available for sale right now. And check out my video on updating B450 motherboards if you want a little bit more details on updating older motherboards to work with the newer processors. Moving on, we have memory. Once again, I used a parametric filter here to look for faster memory. I wanted DDR4 3200 or 3600. I wanted two eight gig sticks. I bumped the cast latency down to 17. So we're only looking at faster memory. And once again, we came up with a Corsair Vengeance LPX kit at the bottom for about $70 if you're sorting by price. There are other options down here, such as a G Skill Rip Jobs 5 and Cru Crucial Ballistic Sport. Uh, but the Corsair Vengeance kit should work just fine with the AMD APU. Just uh, plug in the XMP values and you'll be off and running. Once again, I used a parametric filter searching by price per gigabyte for our storage because I consider a 500 gig class SSD to be the best starting out SSD for an operating system and getting some programs and games installed on it. So once again, we have the ADATA SU635 there, but just as I recommended in the first build, do check for M.2 drives, specifically NVMe M.2 drives. Don't get SATA, I mean, you could get SATA M.2 drives, but you'd have to make sure your motherboard supports that. So look for NVMe M.2 drives uh, as well, maybe the Intel 660p series or an ADATA uh SX6000 would get you more speed from your SSD. Rounding things out, we need a case. Uh, Fractal Focus G is a very solid case. 
Uh, it's only about $56 on Amazon right now. Uh, it doesn't have like a tempered glass side panel window, but it does have a nice big side panel window for you to ogle your system through. It's got plenty of cable management area. It's got a couple fans built in that even have some white LEDs on it. So that's nice. White LEDs are cool because they light up, but you also don't have to worry about wiring them up to some fancy RGB configuration. Uh, it's got a couple drive bays. This is, this is just a solid all around case. It's even got five and a quarter inch bays in the front, which you may or may not be in interested in, but some people actually still like that those are around. That said, just ignore them if you don't need them. It's got enough space for everything else and it's only $56 and it includes fans. Finally, a power supply, the EVGA BQ 600 watt, 80 plus bronze. This one's semi-modular, 80 plus bronze rated, not too much else to say. All black cables, hooray. It will get the job done and it won't have any ugly ketchup and mustard cables standing out that make your build look ugly otherwise. So you get those six parts, you put them together, you have a working system. And then in the future, you could upgrade the CPU to a six core or an eight core or even a 12 core, maybe a 16 core down the line, uh, add a graphics card, uh, plenty of upgrade options for the system. But I like the AMD APUs for sort of a entry level build that you can game with right now that you can also upgrade in the future to be much better and more powerful if you decide you wanted to game and stream or just or play at a higher resolution or crank up the graphics settings to higher settings than what you can play at with the APU. But that's all for this video, guys. Thank you so much for watching. Once again, links to important stuff is down in the video description, so be sure to check that out. I will be building one of these systems later this month. Don't forget to vote in the straw poll as well for next month's builds, and we'll see you guys next time.